Welcome to another episode in our webinar series, A Sectoral, a Sectoral Approach to Climate Mitigation. Today, we are looking at the crucial land use sector, and we have with us, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, as our speakers, uh, Crystal Davis of the World Resources Institute, James Mulder, um, who is a co-founder of Tasman Environmental Markets. And we have Garima Sharma, who is an assistant professor at the Kogod School of Business here at American University. I am going to, uh, to introduce Dr. Sharma, who will uh, moderate the panel. And um, her research focuses on sustainability, CSR, social entrepreneurship, and related tensions of purpose and profits. And so I think that's a good that's a good tension to open up with. And um, so I will uh, turn off my um, my video and ask perhaps people who aren't speaking if they would do that with me and um, look forward very much to the presentation. Thank everyone for joining us. My name is Todd Eisenstadt, uh, and this is the Center for Environmental Policy of the School of Public Affairs. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Todd, and welcome, everybody. It's such an absolute pleasure to be here today and really discuss this very, very important topic and bring some of these excellent speakers to the discussion. How are we going to use the 70 or so minutes that we have? Um, I'm going to invite Crystal Davis to speak about 30 or so minutes, then um, yeah, Crystal will hand over to James, uh, who will serve as a discussant and react to Crystal's remarks. Then we will open this up for audience Q&A. So please, as you hear Crystal and James talk, input your questions in the chat box. And then I'm gonna hand it back to Todd to close and tell us what's next in the webinar. So, uh, so very thrilled to have Crystal with us today. She's the Director of Land and Carbon Lab at the World Resources Institute. Um, I really love, uh, uh, you know, her, uh, sounds like her own passion and project and really expertise in using the earth data revolution to accelerate nature-based solution to climate change. So very, very impactful. So she's actually building a system for monitoring land and its nature-based carbon and providing that information for decision makers so that these decision makers and our leaders can be stewards of our world's finite land. So without any further delay, Crystal, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much. And it is a pleasure to be here. Give me a moment to get my slides pulled up in the proper format because you guys can see the notes, right? Yeah. How to switch it this time? Oh, there we go. Um, did that do it? Yes, looks great. Great. Um, so yes, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I do have some slides to share, but I'm very much looking forward to the discussion, hearing your questions and comments. So I'll try not to eat up too much of our time with talking. But my assignment today is to talk about the land use sector and climate change mitigation. But as we all know, land use is far more than a climate issue. Land use is also central to economic development and poverty alleviation, food security, biodiversity, and environmental protection, et cetera. And if there's one message that I hope you all take home today, it's that when we are building strategies to promote more sustainable land use, we need to be seeing the issue through all these different lenses simultaneously if we are going to succeed. So I'm gonna start with some basic background about the history of land use change on earth. 
human-driven land use change really began in earnest with the invention of agriculture some eight to 10,000 years ago. And over those thousands of years, humanity has converted some 37% of Earth's land mass, excluding Antarctica, into agricultural lands. And all of this conversion came at the cost of about 70% of the world's original grasslands, half of our savannas, nearly half of the world's temperate and deciduous forests, and a third of all tropical forests. But what perhaps is more concerning is this conversion of nature into crops and pasture land is still accelerating. Last year, WRI's Land and Carbon Lab, together with University of Maryland, published the first ever spatially explicit data on cropland change in the 21st century. So this map here shows you areas of stable cropland in yellow, areas where cropland expanded in green, and areas where it was lost in red. And the overall impact was a net increase in global crop area over the past 20 years of over 100 million hectares. That's about an area the size of Egypt. And if you want to put that in perspective, while it took more than 8,000 years for humanity to convert a billion hectares of nature into cropland, it took a mere 20 more years to expand this area by another 10%. Zooming into this 30 meter resolution data set, we can see that certain areas of the world, like West Africa, have experienced a rapid expansion of cropland. In this case, the expansion came primarily at the expense of natural savanna ecosystems. And in other regions like China, we see a net loss of cropland shown here in red, often related to urbanization. But when countries lose cropland, they typically increase their reliance on imports which can in turn drive land use change in far away parts of the world. And this is really what makes land use change and how we address it so utterly complex. We know that China, for example, has increased its soybean imp imports by more than eightfold over the past 20 years, while its domestic production has actually fallen. And we also know that Brazil is by far the biggest supplier of soybeans to China. And here we can see the year by year expansion of soy plantations in Mato Grosso, Brazil over that same time period. And with our data, we estimate that soy has replaced over 8 million hectares of forest in South America since the year 2000. But the biggest driver of land use change, of course, is not actually expansion of cropland, but expansion of pasture and grazing lands. The last 20 years has seen massive global growth in demand for meat and animal products like milk, which is the trend line you see in the top chart here. This trend has been driven by both a growing global population as well as rising incomes. And this expansion has had huge impacts on tropical forests in particular. The bottom graphic shows that cattle are the biggest driver of tropical deforestation, by far responsible for about 40% of all agriculture related deforestation. So what does all this land use change mean for climate? It's estimated that around 20 to 25% of all the carbon that is currently in the atmosphere today can be attributed to all that historical land use change I just discussed. And in terms of current day emissions, the AFALU sector, which stands for agriculture, forestry, and other land use, together accounts for nearly a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions each year. So it's more than transport, more than industry, it's a huge source of emissions. But unlike these other sectors, the AFALU sector is also a huge carbon sink. So as a whole, the world's forests are still absorbing more carbon every year than is being emitted due to deforestation and forest degradation. Tree planting is widely thought to be the most cost-effective carbon sequestration solution. And this is why most believe that the AFALU sector's potential contribution to the climate change mitigation is even larger than its contribution to the problem. The AFALU sector tends to be broken into two component parts. So the first component involves emissions from agricultural production, and that largely comes in the form of methane emissions from livestock production, from rice paddies, as well as nitrous oxide emissions from soil fertilization. And then the second component of the AFALU sector involves emissions from land use, land use change, and forestry, which is referred to as LULU CF. And these emissions are dominated by CO2 that's resulting from deforestation and forest degradation, peatland drainage, and conversion of other natural ecosystems. But even in the case of LULU CF, 
where we're really talking about forests and peat as the big issues, agriculture is again the main culprit because expansion of agriculture as well as out of control spread of fires that are started often for agricultural purposes are the leading causes of forest loss and degradation. So the problem is massive, so is the opportunity, and our food systems are really at the center of the land use challenge. And a few years ago, WRI with the World Bank, UN Environment and others published a major new study looking at how we create a more sustainable and climate friendly food future. So we modeled different scenarios through 2050 and provide a menu of solutions to get us where we need to go. And much of what I'll be sharing today is summarized from this report. So I highly encourage you to download the report online if you wanna get into more detail. Our baseline scenario where is where current land use trends continue in a business as usual fashion paints a pretty bleak picture. The global population is expected to reach over 10 billion people by 2050, including a growing middle class and demand for land intensive commodities are expected to rise accordingly. So for example, we expect a nearly 90% increase in demand for beef and lamb. And even if we assume that agricultural yields continue to improve consistent with historical rates, and that is a pretty big assumption that I'll get into a bit later, we still need to expand the global footprint of agriculture by around 600 million hectares, which is an area nearly twice the size of India by 2050. And since we don't exactly have lots of vacant underutilized land just sitting around to meet these needs, we can assume that this expansion will come at great cost to the world's remaining forests, grasslands, and wetlands. Yet, if we want to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, the IPCC has warned us that we cannot convert any more forests into agriculture. In fact, we need to go further than ending deforestation. We also need to contract existing agricultural lands by 600 million hectares and restore forests back to that land to pull more carbon out of the atmosphere. So the baseline involves expanding agriculture by two Indias. The 1.5 degree pathway requires us to shrink the footprint of agriculture by two Indias. That is a massive shift from business as usual in the land sector. But as I noted at the top of this presentation, land use is not just a climate issue which is what makes the sector so complex and difficult to address. We need to make food systems more climate friendly, of course, but we also need to figure out how to feed and improve the lives of the 10 billion people we will expect in the world by 2050. Food insecurity is still an enormous problem. The share of people facing severe food insecurity is actually rising globally, according to the FAO, as you can see in this chart here. And in addition, more than 70% of the world's poor live in rural areas where most of them depend on agriculture for their principal livelihood. And although agriculture directly accounts for only about three and a half percent of gross world product, that figure is closer to 30% in low income countries. So in short, the ag sector is critical to addressing food insecurity and also ensuring inclusive economic and social development for the world's poorest. It's also worth noting that agriculture has enormous impacts on our freshwater resources. Agriculture accounts for 70% of all freshwater withdrawn from rivers, lakes, and aquifers, and 90% of freshwater consumption by human activities. Freshwater consumption is the portion of the withdrawn water that is permanently lost from its source. Agriculture is also the primary source of nutrient runoff, which creates these dead zones and toxic algal blooms in coastal waters and aquatic ecosystems. So in sum, food system transformation is at the nexus of multiple goals. It's necessary for mitigating and adapting to climate change, protecting our environment and biodiversity, increasing food supply and security, and promoting development and reducing poverty. And because of feedback effects in these systems, Addressing any one of these needs in isolation would probably undermine the chances of meeting all four needs. So for example, we could focus on raising food production by converting more forests and savannas to agricultural lands, but this approach would increase agriculture related GHG emissions. And then the climate effects would have large adverse effects on agricultural output due to higher average temperatures, heat waves, flooding, et cetera. 
And on the flip side, reducing agricultural agriculture's impact on climate and the broader environment in a matter that fails to meet food needs or provide economic opportunities would probably undermine political support for that environmental protection. Just to demonstrate quickly some of these feedback effects, this map shows the regionally diverse but overall net negative impact on crop yields in a three degree Celsius warmer world. Some regions will benefit, some will be worse off, but the overall net global impact on yields is negative. And underlining the equity and food security concerns, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular is likely to see significant negative impacts on food production in a warmer world. One study estimates that climate change could shorten growing seasons in this region by more than 20% by the end of the century. And similarly, water stress is expected to increase in many agricultural areas, which is shown in shades of red on this map. And that's both due to increased agricultural water use, as well as higher temperatures due to climate change. So in the Sustainable Food Futures report, we outline a menu of solutions to feed our planet while also meeting climate development and other environmental goals. So in the yellow bar on the left side of this chart, you have the 2050 baseline emissions. These are the emissions we would expect from the AFALU sector in a business as usual scenario. The yellow bar on the far right is the 2050 target if we hope to keep global warming at two degrees Celsius, that's the top of the bar, or 1.5 degrees if we had to reach the bottom of the bar. And each colored bar in between represents a solution that can help us move from the baseline to the target. Each of these solutions is explored in quite a bit of depth in the report uh, with proposed strategies and approaches. And I'm just gonna provide a really general overview here. A big component in the red column is reducing growth in demand for food and other agricultural products, including by shifting diets, reducing food loss and waste, and phasing out crop-based biofuels. Next, in the green column, we need to find ways to increase food production without expanding agricultural land. This is largely about increasing yields and productivity on existing agricultural lands. The purple column is about increasing fish supply, which is not very important from a climate change mitigation perspective, but is very important from a nutritional perspective. The blue column involves strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural production, for example, through improved manure management and increased efficiency of nitrogen use and fertilizers. And lastly, for those agricultural lands that have been spared or reclaimed, we need to actively protect and restore natural ecosystems. A simpler way to describe and remember this strategy is what we like to call reduce, produce, protect, restore, or I call it R2P2, which means that to transform global food and land use systems, we must find ways to sustainably reduce demand for and consumption of land intensive commodities, produce more food and fiber from existing agricultural lands, protect remaining natural ecosystems from conversion and degradation, and restore degraded and reclaim lands into healthy ecosystems. I'm going to briefly explore each of these strategies in turn, starting with reduce. The big strategies on, the, on this menu are to reduce food loss and waste, shift towards more sustainable diets, and phase out crop-based biofuels, which compete with food crops for limited land resources. I'm gonna focus on the first two strategies today. So starting with food loss and waste, Roughly a quarter of all food produced is lost or wasted from farm to fork. This loss and waste happens in different parts of the food supply chain with the biggest challenges and subsequent opportunities at the end of the supply chain um, on both sides. So in other words, the biggest losses occur on the farm at one end and at your dining room table on the other. Put in other terms, if food loss and waste were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world behind China and the US. So tackling this problem is a huge climate mitigation opportunity. And as we're designing approaches to tackle the problem, it's worth noting that where food loss and waste occurs along the food supply chain varies significantly among regions, as does the magnitude of the problem. So as you can see, North America shown on the left of the chart here is the biggest culprit we lose or waste over 40% of total food available 
and most of this loss occurs at the consumption phase, in other words, in our households. Whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa, on the far right of the chart, only 23% of food is lost or wasted, and most of this is occurring during production, handling, and storage. Champions 12.3 is an example of a leadership coalition that brings together government and private sector to tackle this issue, and there are already some really compelling success stories to be found. For example, between 2007 and 2012, the United Kingdom achieved a 21% decrease in household food loss and waste through a variety of food labeling and public relations efforts. So for example, supermarket chains started printing tips for improving food storage and for lengthening shelf life for fruits and vegetables directly onto the plastic produce bags in the grocery store. And some chains shifted away from buy one, get one promotions for perishable goods towards using price promotions instead. So this is really simple stuff, but it can make a huge difference. The other big piece of the reduced puzzle is shifting diets away from the most land intensive food commodities. And most critically, the biggest impact we could have would be reducing meat consumption by the wealthy. We know that foods differ vastly in their greenhouse gas impacts. Foods that come from animals make up two thirds of all agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. They also use more than three quarters of all agricultural land. In particular, beef, sheep, and goat meat top the charts here, and rice is at the top of the um, for crop types due to the methane emissions. We also knew, know that foods differ vastly in terms of fresh water requirements. Again, meat and beef in particular rise to the top here. And it's really primarily the wealthy that are driving demand for beef, milk, and other animal products. So for example, this shows you how the average American stacks up to world averages. Not only do we consume more calories, but a higher percentage of our calories come from meat and dairy. So our agricultural land use per capita is therefore nearly double the world average and our GHG emissions from agricultural production um, and land use change. And with the rising middle class in countries like China and India, we expect that on average globally, consumption of meat-based proteins are going to rise faster than consumption of plant-based proteins. Again, there's some really exciting work being done in this space. I'm sure you've all noticed in the grocery store and in restaurants that plant-based meat alternatives are becoming more common, more affordable, also more tasty. But how do you change the psychology of a society that is so culturally attached to eating meat? There's some really cool behavioral research happening right now. For example, if you change the words on a menu used to describe the exact same vegetarian dish, can you get more people to buy it? And in our research, we found that using the words meat-free, vegetarian, or vegan actually make people less likely to order. So in one study, we found that separating vegetarian dishes into a separate vegetarian part of the menu made people 56% less likely to order those dishes. On to the next pillar now, produce. So even if we succeed to reduce demand for agricultural commodities, we will still need to produce more food for a growing global population. So how do we produce more food on the same amount of land or even better on less land without also increasing greenhouse gas emissions, water pollution, and other environmental impacts associated with agricultural production? The big strategies on this menu are to sustainably close yield gaps and increase productivity in both crop and pasture lands increase nitrogen use efficiency in fertilizers, and find ways to reduce agricultural methane emissions, which come from rice and livestock. I'm just gonna talk about the yield and productivity issues today for the sake of time. The baseline scenario I presented to you assumes that yields continue to grow consistent with historical rates. So I wanna take a moment to unpack how significant that assumption is. The turquoise line in this chart shows the rise in cereal yields since the 1960s, or since the start of the so-called Green Revolution. It's an over 200% increase in yields. So that's a really ambitious growth rate to keep up for the next 30 years. And what's more, even this historical growth in yields could not prevent a net expansion of crop and pasture land by over 500 million hectares over the same time period. So that's the dark blue line at the bottom of the chart. 
And while it may look like very modest growth relative to yields and production, it's still 500 million hectares of new cropland, one and a half times the size of India. So moving forward, we don't just need to sustain historical increases in yields, we need to increase yields even faster if we want to meet projected food demands without further expanding the footprint of agriculture. The green bar here shows average annual yield growth since 1961 for various commodities. The red bar is the yield growth projected by FAO to 2050. The yellow bar is what we think the more ambitious yield uh, growth that will be needed to keep us at um, 1.5 degrees Celsius. We know there are big gaps in yields and productivity that beg to be filled. For example, this map shows the efficiency of beef production systems in terms of greenhouse gas emissions per unit of meat output. We see more inefficient systems shown in orange and red in many developing countries. According to FAO data, for example, the quantity of feed required per kilogram of beef produced is four times higher in Africa than in Europe. And land use requirements for beef in the most efficient and least efficient systems can vary by a factor of 100. Fortunately, there are well-known ways to increase efficiency of beef and milk production, which generally fall into three categories. There's better feeding, better animal care and management, and better breeding. And realizing these types of improvements in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa could reduce greenhouse gas emissions quite dramatically. Another reason for optimism that increasing yields and productivity may be possible in a sustainable way is that the primary source of growth in agricultural output has shifted away from input increases. So for example, more land, more fertilizer, more water, et cetera, towards what agronomists call total factor productivity, which is basically a fancy way of saying improved technology and better use of technology in farming. So much of the gain we've seen in recent decades has actually resulted from the spread of advanced farming technologies to China, Brazil, and Argentina and it really suggests the power of farming smarter. But critically, we need to bring smarter farming everywhere, no farm left behind, including to millions of smallholder farmers. We also need to target future research and development to so-called orphan crops, for example, that have received relatively little research attention, often because they're little traded on global markets, but they are extremely important for food security in many regions. So these are crops like sorghum, millet, potato, peas, cassava, beans. Um, so farming smart will require investing more to bring new technologies and improve practices to the places uh, and to the crops that need them most. All right, on to part three. It's nice to think that if we succeed in reducing demand for agricultural commodities and increase productivity on existing agricultural lands, that the world's remaining forests will automatically be spared. But unfortunately, this is not often the case, especially when you consider that yield gains, even if they spare land globally, may actually encourage more local conversion of forests and other natural ecosystems because you've lowered production costs. So one way to combat this effect is through jurisdictional programs that have linked production and protection goals. These are often referred to as produce and protect compacts. We also need to strengthen proven conservation mechanisms and financing for those mechanisms like protected areas on the latest wave of 30 by 30 commitments and securing the land tenure rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. I wanna take a moment to really emphasize the challenge of land shifting that I was just describing. So even when there's not a significant net change in crop area or forest area, we often see a significant gross loss of forests due to agriculture because of the shifting agricultural lands. So a farmer may clear a tract of tropical primary forest, cultivate it for some years, and then move on to clear the next, next pasture of forest while leaving the previous land fallow. And while that fallow land may have the opportunity to naturally regenerate as forests, the carbon and biodiversity values lost during that initial conversion are not likely to return in our lifetimes. So this gross loss phenomenon is extremely important, but it's largely been masked over the years by the FAO's global reporting, which focuses on net forest area change. 
But with more recent advent of satellite-based forest monitoring, we're now able to see these gross loss dynamics much more clearly. One obvious target for protection efforts should be road building. In the Brazilian Amazon, for example, 95% of deforestation has occurred within five and a half kilometers of a road. And the environmental impacts of roads go beyond direct land clearing for agriculture. Roads also give people access to the forest, which increases hunting of wildlife and harvesting of timber illegally, as you can see in the bottom image uh, from Global Forest Watch's near real-time monitoring system. Governments around the world already have extensive plans for road building on the books, many of which are expected to bisect existing protected areas and cut into key natural habitats. Many of our multilateral development banks are behind these investments. So this is a key policy area that is ready to be targeted. On a positive note, we know there are strategies that work really well. They just need to be invested in and implemented at scale. So for example, there is ample evidence that indigenous peoples and local communities are effective protectors of forests when their rights are recognized and enforced. So this map shows you net greenhouse gas fluxes, carbon fluxes from forests between 2001 and 2020. So net emissions are shown in shades of purple while the net removals are in light green. So as you can see here, this indigenous reserve in Brazil remains a net sink while the deforested areas surrounding the reserve have become a net source of emissions. And when we scale this analysis using this data, we find that if all the indigenous territories were removed from the Amazon, the Amazon itself becomes a net source rather than a net sink. And on an even more positive note, we also know that it's possible to decouple deforestation from growth in agricultural production. In the early 2000s, Brazil did exactly this. You can see deforestation trending downward in green and soybean and cattle production trending upward in orange and blue, respectively. And critically, Brazil achieved this through a combination of command and control measures targeting forest protection, as well as farmer support incentives targeting better production practices. So you have produce and protect linked in one jurisdiction. So last but not least, we have restore. The restoration opportunity is huge as there is a vast amount of degraded land around the world, which have the potential to be restored both back to native ecosystems as well as to more productive landscapes that also have greater ecological integrity. The world has largely recognized this opportunity. There are 57 national and subnational governments that have committed to restoring over 350 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. What we need now is far greater technical and financial support to realize these commitments, not just for governments, but for the many thousands of local project developers and entrepreneurs who are trying to implement landscape restoration on the ground. And there are many case studies of restoration success we can point to, like that shown in this image. The imperative now is really about scaling. One of the regions where we are seeing some of the greatest emerging ambition, as well as implementation, is in Africa. Under the AFR 100 coalition, African countries have already exceeded their goal of committing 100 million hectares of degraded land into restoration. And along with these area targets, over a billion dollars in development finance and private sector investment have also been committed. And across Africa, hundreds of local restoration projects are now being financed and getting underway. Before I leave this topic of restoration, I really want to emphasize peatlands as a critical priority for restoration efforts. Peatlands are a special type of wetland that are found in most countries around the world, and they are the largest natural terrestrial carbon store. So even though they only cover about 3% of the global land surface, they store more carbon than all other vegetation types combined. But when we drain, burn, and convert peatlands for agriculture, that carbon starts to release from the soil into the atmosphere. The FAO estimates that 26 million hectares of peatlands have already been drained and converted to agriculture, which is responsible for almost 5% of all global anthropogenic emissions each year. The vast majority of these emissions are currently occurring in Indonesia, where the most recent peat degradation has occurred, largely for palm oil production. So again, this is an area that if we target, we could have 
pretty significant um, gains. So that's the end of my very high level tour of the reduce, produce, protect, restore strategies that need to be pursued together if we are to transform global land use systems and create a more sustainable and climate friendly food system. Again, I really encourage you all to check out the report because it has a lot more detail than I was able to provide today. Before I finish up, I'd like to reflect on some of the key cross-cutting challenges, which I think will determine the fate of land use sector for climate mitigation. All of our climate biodiversity and land degradation goals will be out of reach unless investments into nature-based solutions ramp up very quickly. There are different estimates out there of the global financing gap for nature. This recent UN report suggests that we need to close a 4.1 trillion dollar financing gap for nature by 2050. And current investments in nature-based solutions amount to roughly 130 billion dollars, most of which is coming from public sources. And only a measly 3% of climate finance to date has gone towards nature-based solutions, despite the IPCC estimate that nature could contribute over 30% of needed mitigation. And this may, well, it definitely reflects my own personal bias as someone who leads an initiative focused on geospatial data and monitoring. But I believe that one of the key reasons why scaling finance for nature has been so difficult relative to other sectors is because the impacts we are trying to deliver are so difficult to measure and monitor in a way that is accurate, precise, transparent, and most importantly, cost effective. So it is true that there have been incredible advances over the past decade in what we can map and monitor using remote sensing and artificial intelligence. So as an example, almost 10 years ago, we launched Global Forest Watch as the first ever high resolution global system for monitoring tree cover loss and deforestation in near real time. And more recently, thanks to even higher resolution satellite imagery now available to the public for free from the EU's Copernicus program, we are now able to map and monitor the individual trees growing outside of forests in restoration landscapes. But so many aspects of nature that we care about cannot be seen and cannot be monitored from space, even with the highest resolution satellite imagery. Biodiversity, ecosystem services, uh, and of course the social and economic impacts of our nature-based interventions, these are the things that measurement and monitoring still needs to be done with boots on the ground. It's very high effort, it's very high cost. And of particular concern is the challenge of measuring and monitoring carbon emissions and removals from nature-based solutions, whether we're talking about avoided emissions from stopping deforestation or increasing carbon sequestration, sequestration from landscape restoration. So these carbon fluxes from nature cannot be directly observed like one would measure emissions from a smokestack on a factory. They can be estimated based on local on the ground measurements of biomass and biomass change over time. Basically go to the same tree, measure it each year, but this is a very costly and labor intensive exercise. And we can try to model it at larger geographic scales using remote sense, uh, sensing um, to map biomass and biomass change. And this is much faster and cheaper but these models introduce a lot of uncertainty and carbon markets don't like uncertainty, especially when you're talking about generating fungible carbon credits. So this has been, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges to getting the red plus mechanism off the ground within carbon markets. And just over the past year, we've been seeing all kinds of hype about biodiversity credits or even premium carbon credits that deliver additional biodiversity benefits. And from where I sit as someone trying to build the measurement and monitoring tools for these finance mechanisms, measuring biodiversity impacts accurately and cost effectively at scale presents an even bigger challenge than carbon. So that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for your time and attention and definitely looking forward to the discussion and questions. Well, thank you so much, Crystal. Wow, what a wealth of knowledge. And I loved your data presentations, not surprisingly. You've come with lots of expertise in that and really also appreciate all the solutions that, that you've researched and you've provided. So thank you for that. And I already see questions coming in. So 
please keep inputting your questions in the Q&A box in the webinar. Um, I'm going to now invite James, uh, James Mulder, to respond to Crystal's um, really wonderful presentation and add his own thoughts. And I'm just going to take a second to introduce James, who's the co-founder of Tasman Environmental Management. And he's been an active participant in carbon and environmental markets in New Zealand, Australia, and Asia for over two decades as both a trader and risk manager. And I found this example so interesting and exciting that his expertise led to the design of Singapore's electricity trading market, among many other opportunities. So uh, James, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much for that. And uh, great to follow on from Crystal, a very, very illuminating presentation um, and one which um, you know I'll add to. So for us, um, as a business trying to design and build carbon sinks uh, of various varieties uh, for, for customers. Um, some of the challenges that Crystal has raised are, uh, are very real to us in, a, you know, in an everyday sense. If I think about um, the carbon element to it, as opposed to the food element, um, and focusing on the sort of protect and restore elements that Crystal talked about, I think most people are pretty, um, pretty comfortable with the, you know, the why and the what questions. So why are we doing this and what are we trying to do around protecting uh, and restoring uh, forests and particularly the, those in the tropical bands uh, of the world. The area that most people have trouble with is um, the how and the who. How do we do this? And Crystal raised a number of the items related to financing. Uh, but also around regulations and so forth, and who and who needs to do this. So, from my perspective, I think that's where a lot of the challenges come. And at a very high level, we also see a lot of philosophical or ideological problems with this, because you you get into a lot of geopolitical sort of sort of arguments where, you know, people who are advocates for the global south will say. Why is it that uh, the global north are uh, again um, leaning on the global south to fix their own problems? Why don't they fix it themselves? So all of a sudden we, we start to run into a lot of interference and a lot of commentary, which um, is actually not necessarily about the forests themselves or about actually what's being delivered in the forests. They're actually ideological issues about much bigger issues whether they be geopolitics or the role of markets uh, in solving the climate problem. So for us, we, we do take the view that putting a price on carbon is really, really important. And that's not only for restoring and, uh, and protecting rainforests and forests more generally, but also we see it as an important element to hold businesses to account and to make sure that there is a counterfactual uh, around their own emissions so that they are actually valuing the true cost of pollution. So for us as a business, our focus has been very much on regenerative agriculture in Australia. Um, a number of the uh, agricultural practices uh, over the last sort of 50 years in some parts of, of this part of the world, uh, and, I, and I am on the other side of the world at the moment as I speak to you, um, have been less than ideal. Uh, I think any, any rational person looking at some of the, the practices would not describe them as, um, as sustainable in any, you know, you know, by any measure. So a big challenge for us is how do we actually right-size properties? How do we actually continue to, to develop um, properties either for crops or for agriculture, but do it in a sustainable way where the properties themselves can actually sustain um, you know, the impact of, of animals or crops on those pieces of land. So that leads us in many cases to afforestation initiatives or at least protection initiatives on um, agricultural blocks. As it relates to red and, and also even things like cook stoves, there are a number of projects that we can do and have done in the third world or, or the global south, which have promoted a, the protection of properties uh, or, or areas, um, particularly when we're actually working with indigenous communities. I mean, that's been the real, um, the really obvious thing that hadn't occurred sort of 10 years ago with a lot of the red development. Um, 
it's actually those indigenous communities that need to be at the center of all of um, all of the red efforts and making sure that the people that are actually bearing the burden of protecting these forests are also the beneficiaries of any financing that comes through. So one of the challenges that we've found in, uh, in using markets has been how do we ensure that the money actually does get in most part to the people that are actually sharing the burden or, or, or being burdened by an encumbrance on their rights around forests. So some real challenges in that area as well. Cook stoves um, seems a, a little bit sort of foreign as a concept around, uh, around forestry, but certainly we see projects, good projects being done in the global south around cook stoves, largely because they reduce the amount of of biomass that is needed to be um, combusted for cooking. Um, you know, these cook stoves can are about 50% more efficient than an open fire. And that leads to a number of other benefits from uh, in communities as traditionally women, other, other people that are tasked with collecting firewood during the day. And if that burden is reduced considerably, then they have much more free time to spend with children or doing other things. So we see a number of benefits from some of the projects that we that we put together. But the real challenge is making sure, and, and Crystal sort of articulated this point, so how do we get that funding? How do we actually get the money into the communities to actually make the difference? And how do we take um, the data that we're getting out of these projects with a high degree uh, not absolute, because that would be uh, pretty much impossible, but with a very high degree uh, of fidelity, how do we actually understand what we've actually achieved and what the counterfactual is from, um, uh, you know, from protecting those particular blocks of land. So again, um, without, you know, sort of curtailing the discussion period, um, we really see that protect and restore element of uh, of Crystal's presentation, really sort of hitting the road or you know, our feet hitting the ground as it relates to how do we actually build these projects and actually have the mechanisms by which firms, individuals and countries can actually interact with them. Um, there has been, and many people would have read them, a lot of articles, um, regrettably not necessarily in, in peer reviewed journals, but uh, a lot of articles about you know, the veracity of the red schemes. Um, and there's no question, some of them are less than ideal. Um, but I think the challenge here is to learn from that and to make them better rather than just putting a line through them and saying, let's not do that. Because there are very few effective ways of getting dollars into Indigenous communities um, to actually improve their lot um, outside of these types of schemes. Um, so I'm going to pause there for a moment um, and, and take the opportunity to, uh, to engage in a discussion. Thank you so much, James. Thanks for bringing those real world examples really from around the globe uh, to the brilliant ideas that Crystal introduced. Um, Crystal, if you don't mind, uh, if you could switch on your video as well and we can open up for discussion. This might be a good time. Um, so there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat and then I have a few questions too, as I heard both of you talk. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with the first one and it says, what business models for land-based or nature-based solutions do we have? And are the incentives sufficiently large? So either of you uh, want to start? I, I might take that one to start with, uh, if that's okay, Crystal. I, th I think... Um... <laughs> A lot of people have come up with the mechanisms, things like Red Plus, um, to try and address the funding gaps. Um, and the, the challenge here is, is that for, for markets to be successful, there needs to be confidence. If the markets don't, if people are not confident around the particular instrument that's being created that they're purchasing, then the market will fail. And that's kind of what we're having now. We've got this ideological debate around whether this is a good idea in the first place, whether these sort of markets are ethical. And as a result, that is really sapping confidence in these markets and therefore the degree to which private sector investment into these areas um, is available is reducing. 
um, which then does really bring into question whether or not there is a, a funding model that can work. I would argue that without that, we're going to rely on direct government in, uh, investment. And particularly in the current climate, I think that's really unlikely. So I think there is a real crisis of confidence in some of these markets where people actually do need to, pre um, to present their positionality around what their objection is and actually deal with the, those issues rather than just um, you know, using these as sort of political footballs. So I do think there's a real challenge around the, you know, the mechanisms for funding these sort of projects. Christian? Yeah, um, just to maybe expand, there's been so much focus on carbon markets as the biggest potential source of private sector finance that could go towards nature. And there have really been three issues that have driven the crisis of confidence, maybe a fourth, but additionality, like can we actually believe that these emissions reductions or removals are real with respect to some baseline that someone has made up? Because if you can imagine, you know, to get an emission reduction from deforestation, you are guessing what you think future deforestation will be. Well, it's a very hard thing to, to, to guess at. So you have to believe in that baseline future scenario to believe that the reduction is real. The other issues are around leakage and permanence. Uh, so on permanence, for example, yes, you've saved the forest today, but will a fire come through that was largely out of your control and wipe it out tomorrow after your credit has been issued? So these are real issues and there are a lot of processes internationally to create sort of the standards and rules of the game that can create a robust market infrastructure that people can have faith in. But then once you've created these really rigorous rules and standards for how you set your baselines and how you measure and monitor report and verify, where you know my team is trying to deliver on the monitoring, the, the sort of the measurement solutions for that. And it's just, it's really difficult to deliver the level of accuracy that is needed at a cost that is reasonable, at a cost that does not, you know, that is not greater than what you hope to benefit from selling a carbon credit. So that's a, a huge issue with markets still, and I don't know where it's gonna land, but there's a lot of folks who feel right now, this is like the critical moment that for markets to succeed or fail for nature. But then I would also point out that even looking beyond carbon markets, um, there are a lot of interesting business models that are emerging, for example, around landscape restoration, but access to like traditional private capital is, is still very difficult because the returns on investment for a lot of these projects are very long, it's very risky. So traditional capital just doesn't want to touch it. So that's why the folks have been looking at a lot of blended finance um, mm -hmm. models where we can take some sort of public funding to de-risk and then private f finance can come in over the long term. Mm -hmm. I can just jump in there. I, I mean, I, I think this is really problematic. Um, and even just the concept of additionality being applied. So on one hand, you've got people talking about additionality for red and, and nature-based solutions. But then you've got, on the other hand, you've got you know schemes that say, for example, for renewable energy, that none of no renewable energy units are now additional. And yet, in the same time, you've got India announcing that they need to commission 56 gigawatt out of gigawatts of new coal-fired power stations between now and 2030. So we have these massive disconnects around what is additionality. And um, you know, so we can say look, it's no longer additional, and yet we're adding more coal. So we we also need to get a little more practical around what is meant by additional. And if people are prepared to fund it, you know, maybe maybe be less academic about what what is that exact line? Because I think I worry that we are getting far too precise mm. and not accurate enough. You know, and we're going to miss the target. It's going to be beautifully accounted for, but we will miss. And I think that line around additionality is far too skinny, needs to be wider, so that there is actually a little bit of, um, you know, the realism of some of these land based projects becomes a lot more um, uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. Could you also define additionality, James? I know Crystal said it's about uncertainty, but for those in the audience who may not fully be following nature-based market, in your understanding, how would you define additionality? It's just this concept that um, would it have occurred anyway? What's the counterfactual? So if a piece of land 
is nowhere near a road. It was never going to be converted into a palm oil plantation. Therefore, claiming it as you know being protected because there was no prospect of it being flattened, um, it, you know, is behind this idea of additionality, which is absolutely valid. There's absolutely no question that that's really important. All I'm arguing is, is I think we've just got you know we're, we're out there with you know really really precise instruments around some of this stuff now where. Um, the reality on the ground seems to be divergent. Yeah, and the renewable energy case is a, is a classic example. Mm -hmm. If you're still building coal-fired power, it must, you know, renewables must be additional by definition. Mm -hmm. that, that's the test. Not whether somebody on a spreadsheet says, you know, there's a rational business case for it not to be. And another thing that when I hear both of your responses is sort of, James, you're also bringing in the ideological differences in addition to the practical issues that Crystal raised, which sort of gets me also to this question, Crystal, you know, I'm so on board with the idea of using data to convince, but I think using data might get us around the practicality issues, hopefully, <laughs> but what about the ideological differences? What has been your experience in data presentation and data use to navigate those ideological differences when it comes to um, mitigation, climate change mitigation and land use? How do we bridge those ideological differences using data? Yeah. Um... It's interesting. We like to think that data is this neutral objective thing, but data is extremely political. <laughs> um, and one of the challenges we face with our work on Global Force Watch is that what we are able to measure in terms of sort of biophysical change from space. So trees are there, then tomorrow trees are not there anymore. We can see that from a satellite, um, but that doesn't always line with uh, definitions or perceptions around what, what deforestation actually is and what it means. Uh, most think of deforestation as a permanent land use change. Mm -hmm. um, so if you cut down a primary forest, you know, if you clear cut it for logging in Canada and then you walk away and let it regrow, well, maybe that's not deforestation officially, but something significant has been lost. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes the politics and debates around data and which data is right is sort of obscuring the the, the core facts of the matter. Um, and we need to find ways to, to move the conversation beyond like which data set is correct to how do all these different sources of data developed using different methods, which are hopefully transparent, how do they give us a better picture of the problem and potential solution? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I would almost, just adding to that, Crystal, I, I would, you know, a lot of the challenges are ontological. You know, people have different realities around, you know, the core problem. And the data won't help. You know, if you're a person that sits a, in an environmental organisation in California and your starting point is that the first world must reduce all of their emissions to net zero before you ask the global south to do a thing, then none of this will work. Mm. If, that's your, if that's your starting point, and for many it is, and that's the reason why that they're, you know, they, they just say no, you know, they hold up their hand and just say, you know, no. So one of the challenges for us is to be really open about our positionality at the outset of these conversations so we actually understand where people are coming from. And um, that, that hasn't been immediately obvious. Um, but maybe to flip this around into an opportunity the examples I gave around shifting diets, right? Like you can throw data at people all day long about like the, the negative land use and greenhouse gas implications of eating meat, but meat is important to them. It's like part of our like social or cultural values, right? But you can just change some very minor wording on a menu and people might be attracted to eating different things other than meat without having to throw data at them, right? So the sort of getting into people's minds and what makes people tick and how they how they make decisions and what drives their decisions, often not data, often other things. Um, but we can we can research that more explicitly. And definitely the whole revolution um 
the research around nudges and you know how nudges mm -hmm. help people change mm -hmm. their behaviors very much in line with I loved that menu example and it's almost these different levels I think James is reminding us of sort of this dialogue and open dialogue we need to have and you're telling us that it's sort of these micro changes hand in hand with that big open dialogue around ideas and realities and we need both so I think that's really a good way to think about solutions I think um so I uh, so Johan has uh, inputted a bunch of questions. <laughs> so I'm just going to pick up maybe uh, two very practical questions that they have asked. Uh, so it's around this either or of whether do you demolish old factories and restore them as grasslands for growing foods, or you let businesses use those and transform the old factories for the production. Then another sort of either or, or which is the worst <laughs> sort of uh, action is you build homes and communities in the mountains or demolish forest for beef production. So maybe also taking a step like about abstract from these really concrete either or is, you know, is this also the right approach? Is this how decision making sort of uh, goes forward in your experience where we can take these, because it's a system and we think about ecosystems and land and, you know, it's a systems. And so Johan is reminding us that every decision we make is a decision we are not making. So how do you sort of grapple with that? Uh, what's, the, what's the right approach to think about these issues? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that comes down to the process of, of land use planning, spatial planning that drives the decisions about how a given piece of land is used and acknowledging that any use of land has an opportunity cost to other potential uses of land. And what we need is better spatial data to be able to drive those decisions so that we understand when we choose to use a land piece of land in a certain way, this is what the greenhouse gas implications are going to be. This is what the water implications are going to be. These are what the food security implications are going to be. You know, to model these different scenarios to drive that decision. But right now, a lot of these decisions are just being made based on who can pay the most, you know, <laughs> who can pay the biggest bribe to get this piece of land to do what I want to do with it. So we can make this land use planning process a lot more deliberate and a lot more data driven towards the multiple goals that we're trying to balance in any given place. Mm hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I'd just just you know, if I raise the question up, um, I, I think we're beyond the or type questions. You know, we 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 have run out of time, and we're now, I think, needing to get to ands rather than ors. I don't think there are the, the trade offs are too difficult now, and we've actually just pretty much got to do everything we can, and um, you know, designing for best and most efficient. Um, you know, I think those that was probably available to us 25 years ago, but I don't know that it is today. And I think we we do need to concentrate on on the ands rather than the ors. Yeah, and I'm fully on board. Um, you know, sort of some of my own research is around how you encourage decision makers to make that shift from either or to both and and. I think in many ways, a piece of that puzzle is also how do you shift from A causes B to a systems view, you know, where we allow for different kind of relationships. And I don't know if in your work or in your own, um, you know, experience as decision maker, if you've seen that shift to a more systems based thinking, if you have any examples of that. Well, I, I mean, just just around systems thinking, I, I think. It, it is starting to happen. I think people are a lot more aware of the, the externalities and consequences of a lot of their, you know, A to B type decisions. But um, uh, as my grandfather used to say, it's all about where you put the needle on the record. Where do you start? And the problem with a lot of the systems thinking is, is that people put self-serving start points for their mm. assess, assessment of the system. And one of the things that we run into in this part of the world is just dealing with indigenous communities in a, in a really respectful and open way where, you know, they are, and using a Maori word from here, you know, tangata whenua, they are the people of the land. They are in the land. It is their, it is their home. It is their environment. And respecting that as we go forward and try and improve the, the biodiversity or, or the carbon stocks of that particular land are really important. So systems thinking is really important so long as your start point is, is the right start point. And if it's not, 
it's not terribly useful at all. That's great. Yes, you have to have a North Star. That's more than your individual interest. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Todd had a question that he sort of sent to me. Um, it's for you, Crystal. Certainly individuals can change diets, but what can and should governments do in this sensitive and difficult area in general of you know, diets and food? Should government regulate menus? Should they have mandated more efficient brief production or ration it? What do you think are some of those concrete solutions beyond just, you know, what you encourage sort of these micro nudges? What are the sis uh, policy solutions, I guess? Yeah, um, to be honest, this is not my, my area of expertise, um, but I think there is a role of governments in setting the commitments, creating the targets, um, and providing transparent monitoring and measurement of performance in the private sector on this issue um, to create sort of healthy competition um, towards being able to reduce um, emissions from, from providers of, of food services. Um, and I think there's also incentives and financial support that can be provided as well. Um, but I can definitely share with the folks who are on the call some of the literature WRI has produced on this. That'll be great. James, do you have any reactions to more policy-based solutions? I guess the sort of neoliberal experiment of the last 40 years is sort of coming to an end. And my view is, is that regulations will provide a huge opportunity for people to actually correct some of the imbalances that we've seen over the last 40 years. So if you look to the European Union about how, you know, not only in food, but even in, you know, electricity consumption, and a whole range of things, people have, you know, governments are getting much more prescriptive because the market won't deliver in the time frame that they require the changes to be made. So I actually do think regulation is something that will happen. And, you know, the human condition is that people will grumble for a while and then two weeks later, they'll forget that it was ever an issue. So mm -hmm. I, I do actually think maybe not to the point of outlawing a, a sirloin or a, or a filet mignon, um, but getting much more prescriptive about what is acceptable around uh, food, water use, and so on. I, th I think that's inevitable over the next 20, 30 years. Mm, that's great. So this next one is for you, James. Uh, how do we guarantee performance of Red Plus initiative, which tend to work on fixed year contracts? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I don't know that there is a, a, an effective answer. I mean, the, the work that's been done by the verification of the so-called MRV type frameworks within, within RED is a work in progress. And it does need to improve and it is and has improved since it was, was started a few years ago. Even just the addition of the plus bit to RED has been a huge improvement. So I think everyone understands how important the biosphere is or, or, or the forests are for our ongoing you know, sort of survival as a species. So to that end, I think this congruence of understanding are the standards, you know, needing to improve progressively over time? Absolutely. But if we're looking for private sector funding, it will need to be itemised and unitised so that people can actually, you know, account for it and, and provide the funding. So, um, you know, I don't think there's much to get us away from that. You know, the unitization is actually a really important part of the commercial process because it, because it creates a fungible trading right or, you know, it's not quite a property right, but um, well, maybe it is a property right. Um, and that's actually what's important. So getting away from, uh, you know, an annual credit would be difficult unless governments around the global north just emptied their pockets into the global south and fixed the problem that way. Thank you. Crystal, do you have any reactions to that topic or? Um, no, I don't think I have much to add. I just, I, th I think to, it, it, it's unfortunate to me that carbon markets to work for Red Plus requires us to prove that there is an immediate threat to the nature that we're trying to protect. We need to find other sources of financing that just incentivize protection regardless of the immediacy of the threat. That's a great point. 
So also a good segue to hand it back to Todd, who can um, tell us what's next to come. But before I do that, I just want to thank both of you with the generosity with which you've shared your knowledge and you, sh you know, shared your time to be here today with us. And I learned a lot from you and I'm sure our participants did too. So thank you. Todd? Thank you very much, uh, Garima Sharma, for your precision as a moderator and for running a tight ship and a good program. Uh, thanks to Crystal Davis for presenting to us the very nuanced and overlapping policy areas that you know constitute the land area with the land use area, which seems to present not only difficulties and obstacles, but also tremendous opportunities as you presented it. So thank you. And to James Mulder, thank you for joining us uh, at, in the middle of the night, right? And and for um, for presenting a very good sort of on the ground practical complement to uh, to the discussion and for giving me a segue, which is the and or segue, which is to say that in addition to the land use sector, uh, next week in the the penultimate of these webinars, we will be discussing the industrial sector. And, and it is important to consider what may be perhaps the, the largest single set of emissions uh, on a sectoral level as we try to address how to mitigate using the IPCC's sectoral designations. And, you know, perhaps land use may be the most complex in terms of uh, people's interactions with the land and with their food and with the forests. So this is a tremendous challenge. And I just wanna thank all of you again for joining us uh, and for helping us engage on this on these questions and to uh, to wish all of you a, a an excellent day. And um, thanks for, for the Center uh, for Environmental Policy at American University to to everyone who joined us and thanks especially also to uh, Garima Sharma of the uh, business school the Kogod School of Business and to again Crystal Davis from the WRI World Resources Institute and James Mulder um, who is Ta Tasman Environmental Markets uh, founder if I'm correct yeah Fo founding director um, and Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.